Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting discussion in the world of anatomy and physiology. Today is going to be a very short session. It's going to be a much shorter session because we're only going to cover the tail end of the muscle chapter notes, um, comparing cardiac and smooth muscle. I was going to start the nervous system, but we're just going to hold off on that until Monday. I want to make sure that you really have a chance for the muscle notes chapter 10 to really simmer. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right on in. So the structure of cardiac muscle is a little bit different than what we find for skeletal muscle. True, it does have striations like skeletal muscle, but unlike skeletal muscle that's found all over your body and associated with all of your bones, cardiac muscle is only found in one place, hence the name cardiac. It's only found in your heart. There are seven characteristics of cardiocytes, and a cardiocyte, cardio heart site cell, is a cardiac muscle cell. Um, it does have a little bit of similarity with skeletal muscle. A, it has striations like we see with skeletal muscle, but unlike skeletal muscle cells, the cells themselves are much smaller, and they have more a branching characteristic to them, whereas with skeletal muscle cells, they're large, they have many nuclei, and they're in very straight lines. Cardiac muscle cells have a more branching appearance. Um, instead of having many nuclei like skeletal muscle will have, cardiac muscle only has one single nucleus on there. So there's just one nucleus there, um, and it's not multinucleated that we'd see with skeletal muscle. There are t in cardiac muscle, but they're not um, nearly as narrow as the T-tubules in skeletal muscle. They're much shorter and they're wider. Um, in addition to having a different structural configuration of the T-tubules, there also aren't any triads. So remember the triad consisted of the sarcoplasm reticulum, terminal cisternae, and then it had the T-tubules that were on there. And the reason for that is because the sarcoplasm reticulum, which is still found in cardiac muscle, is configured differently than it is for skeletal muscle muscle. Calcium has a slightly different role in cardiac muscle than it would have for skeletal muscle. In fact, the role of calcium in cardiac muscle contractions is to increase the relative refractory period to make sure that another action potential doesn't take place right away. So that's the job of calcium in cardiac muscle cells. The job of calcium in skeletal muscle cells is, well, you already know the song and dance. Calcium is released from the terminal cisternae through the T-tubules. It binds to troponin, causes tropomyosin to roll off of the active site. Once it rolls off of the active site of the G-protein, a.k.a. F-actin, a.k.a. G-actin, the myosin head is attracted towards that pull to thin filament in towards the center, and ATP recocks that myosin head. So that role of calcium binding to troponin doesn't happen in cardiac muscle cells. That only happens um, in skeletal muscle cells. So there aren't really any triads. As I said before, there is still a sarcoplasm reticulum for cardiac cells, but they don't have the terminal cisternae because they don't need to hold calcium because calcium has a different role. Because your heart is like one of my favorite um, Florence and the Machine songs, Between Two Lungs, um, there are there's a, a huge amount of oxygen that's available. So of course, the best way to generate energy or ATP to recop those myosin heads is aerobically because there is a great amount of oxygen that's readily available right to the left and right side of the heart. So it makes sense that it should engage in aerobic metabolism as a means to get the energy that it needs to perform its functions. So there's lots of myoglobin. Remember, that's the respiratory pigment that holds onto oxygen and lots of mitochondria, which is the structure within cells that's responsible for generating ATP. Now, the intercalated disc, their role is to propagate that action potential from one cell to the next. In cardiac muscle cell, that job of propagating the action potential was the role of the T-tubules. In cardiac muscle cells, to get that heart to beat succinctly, top, bottom, top, bottom, and all the cells at the top contract at the same time and all the cells at the bottom contract at the same time, in between each cardiac muscle cell are these intercalated discs, which are really just gap junctions that allow for um, that signal in the form of chemicals to be transmitted very quickly from one cell to its neighbor. So here we're looking at some cardiac muscle cell. This is just a picture of a slide that we've probably all seen before. You can kind of already see the branching. This area here are the intercalated disc at this cross section. And notice that we have our sarcoplasm reticulum, the blue webbing. And then we also have this T-tubule, um, but it's going to be shorter, wider. And then also make note that there are no sarcoplasm reticulums. And remember, we don't need those sarcoplasm reticulums in cardiac muscle cells because calcium is not stored there in the same way.
And here's just kind of a close-up of that. We still look at the myofibrils. We have our mitochondria. We still have our sarcolema and our short YP tubules, our sarcoplasmic reticulum, minus the terminal cisternae. So now on to smooth muscle. The places that you will find smooth muscle are going to be in the walls of your hollow organ. So it typically forms around other tissues. Some very explicit places that you'll find smooth muscle are in your blood vessels, and we'll talk at length about each of these organ systems next semester in AMP2. But in your blood vessels, you have smooth muscles that will constrict the blood vessels or cause them to dilate to regulate blood flow and pressure. You also find them in your reproductive and glandular system. So every month, if you are fortunate enough to have a uterus, there will be this peristolic rhythmic contractions of your uterus that will slough off the endometrial lining of your uterus every month. Um, if you have um, testes, if you're fortunate enough to have those, and in ejaculation, you have the smooth muscle contraction of the testes that will ejaculate the semen um, from the testes. In your digestive and urinary systems, um, you have a sphincter that goes from your esophagus into your stomach. We call that your cardiac sphincter. When food reaches that cardiac sphincter, that sphincter or that ring of smooth muscles opens up and drops the food in there. As the food goes from your digestive or your stomach to your small intestine, you have the pyloric sphincter that will dilate and open up and allow for food to pass through there. And once again, there are these contractions that take place to open and close these sphincters for either your reproductive system or your urinary and digestive system. You have these peristaltic movements that we make up those contractions. And we've already talked about the erectopilli muscle that fluorent causes goosebumps in your integumentary system. Now, some features that are similar between smooth muscle and cardiac muscle is that both of them are under your involuntary control. You don't have to consciously think about these, mo these muscles being in motion or action in order for their contractions to take place. On the other hand, skeletal muscle is muscle that you consciously think about and you consciously control where that goes. The consciousness that you're using, we call that part of a different type of nervous system. So that's under your, your voluntary control nervous system. Things that you don't have to think about, like your heart beating, your blood vessels getting smaller or larger, or constricting and dilating, the contraction of your erector pili muscle that causes your hair to stand on end when you're nervous or anxious or scared, um, all of that is under what we call your autonomic nervous system. And we will talk at great lengths about your autonomic nervous system. Um, start on Monday, actually. So unlike cardiac and skeletal muscle, smooth muscle is non-striated. It has a different organization of the actin and myosin filaments, so you're not going to have the striations on there. And because of that different organization of actin and myosin, it's also going to have different functional characteristics. So what we're looking at here is both smooth muscle, but we have two different pictures of how we took that smooth muscle. This picture of the smooth muscle shows all of the nice stereotypic features that we would expect to see in a smooth muscle cell. You have flat, disc-shaped nuclei. The cells themselves are thick in the middle, and then they taper towards the end, so they're more spindle-shaped. Um, and they're sort of long. They're these long, slender cells. So what we're looking at here is a longitudinal section of the tissue, that we cut the tissue longwise and we look down on top of it. On the other side, we have a transverse section of the tissue. So what we've done is that we've just taken a cross section of the tissue and then we're looking at it in a crossverse or a transverse angle. Notice that the picture that's represented in the transverse tissue looks a little different than what we see on the longitudinal side. Everything that we've shown you in lab and that we've talked about in our histology portion of the Unit 1 lab, they should have all looked like this. They should have looked like uh, the lengthwise, the longitudinal section where the smooth muscle cells have all those stereotypical um, features that we expect to see for them. But depending on how that tissue is made, you could be looking at it like this. So as you go on through your studies to get into med school or vet school or nursing school or your OT programs or wherever this class may take you, you may see transverse sections or longitudinal sections of smooth muscle. So I just kind of want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind that even though we expect smooth muscle to have disc-shaped nuclei, be very spindle-shaped and long, they might not look like that depending on how that cut was made. So those features are eight characteristics of smooth muscles. Just pausing for a second here on what I want you to take home from this 
portion of the notes today. Um, those seven characteristics of cardiac muscle and these eight characteristics of smooth muscle, you should be familiar with them. You should know them and be able to compare and contrast smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and skeletal muscle. So make sure that you know those seven characteristics of cardiac muscle as well as those eight characters, these eight characteristics of smooth muscle. So they're long and slender, spindle shaped, tapered at the end, fatter in the center. Um, like cardiac muscle, they have a single nuclei. Skeletal muscle is the only one that is multinucleated. Unlike skeletal and cardiac muscle, there are no T tubules, no myofibrils, no sarcomeres, no contractile unit of muscle. Um, because these muscles, the smooth muscle, are, um, are in the walls of organs, such as your esophagus, your stomach, your large intestines, your small intestines, your blood vessels, there's really no need for a tendon or that broad, flat, connective tissue that connects the muscle to the bone, so there are no aponeuroses here either. The myosin fibers are kind of scattered throughout, and they have lots of heads on them. And they have lots of heads on these myosin fibers because the actin filaments are attached to dense bodies, and they're also scattered throughout the, the tissue, scattered throughout the, the muscle cell. So the thin filaments attach to these dense bodies, so we want to make sure we have enough myosin heads to connect to one of those to pull them in. Smooth muscle, because of the way that we have this myosin and these thin filaments more scattered throughout the cell, they have more of a rhythmic type of contraction. And we call those rhythmic contractions peristalsis. So you don't have those nice succinct contractions or shortening of the sacromere that you see in cardiac muscle or skeletal muscle. In smooth muscle, we're looking more for of a flow, for it's a rhythmic type of contraction that we see here. And it's because of those dense bodies that the thin filaments are attached to that that's what transmits this contraction from one cell to the next, giving us that nice rhythmic wave-like flow that we call peristalsis. So how that process takes place is like skeletal muscle with the help of calcium. Unlike skeletal muscle, calcium is going to trigger the contraction not by binding to troponin, as we saw in skeletal muscle, but by binding with calmodulin. Calmodulin is in the sarcoplasm or the cytoplasm of the muscle cell, and what it will do is this binding of calcium to calmodulin is going to activate the myosin-like kinase reaction. So it's an enzymatic reaction that takes place as a result of the calcium binding to the calmodulin. Because of that enzymatically um, place reaction, that enzymatic reaction, then this enzyme kinase will break down ATP and that's what generates the contraction. And remember, what that contraction looks like, it's going to be very wave-like, um, peristaltic, what we call peristaltic contractions. For your exam, you should be able to compare and contrast skeletal muscle contraction and smooth muscle contraction, specifically understanding the role of calcium in both of them. So know that calcium binds to troponin in skeletal muscle contraction and that cascade of events that takes place from there. And also know for smooth muscle contraction that calcium, instead of binding to troponin, is going to bind to calmodulin. And when that takes place, it activates a series of enzymes that will break down ATP and further initiate the contraction. So we have different controls of the contractions for smooth muscle cells, but skeletal and cardiac muscle cells, it was a, the, a motor neuron kind of sent that information there. Um, for cardiac muscle cells, a motor neuron will send the information to the contractile cells of the heart called your pacemaker cells, once again, all of which we will discuss at length in AMP2. Um, and in skeletal muscle cells, it was just the neuromuscular junction. Acetylcholine was released, binds to the motor end plate of the muscle cell, allows sodium ions to come in. Now, the control of the contraction for smooth muscles is variable. So there are two types we have. If it's a multi-unit smooth muscle cell, then it's going to kind of be like skeletal muscle. It's contract connected to a motor neuron. Whereas if it's a visceral smooth muscle cell, there isn't a motor neuron that's directly connected to it. The pacemaker cells are going to control the contraction. So for example, in the peristaltic contractions that take place in your esophagus, you have a motor neuron um, kind of initiates this contraction, or actually it's the pressure from, um, it's a somatic neuron, not a motor neuron. The pressure from the food entering your esophagus is going to trigger this cell to set the pace and start the contraction so that this part where the food bulges into your esophagus, it triggers those cells, and when it triggers those cells, and then they're going to say, all right, next portion, I need you to contract. So we have this rhythmic cycle of contraction and relaxation that happens with these pacemaker cells that are not stimulated by the brain telling the cell to do something, but more or less because of the presence of a stimulus. In the case of your esophagus, that stimulus would be food that triggers those reactions to take place. 
So that is the end of it, folks. Um, we will start nerve in our very next lecture. We'll start the nerve tissue um, in much the same way that we took a, ner uh, a tour of the muscle cell when we began our muscle histology and our discussion on chapter 10. We'll do the same thing for the nervous system. We'll kind of get in our magic school bus and we'll take a tour of all of the structures that we should see and we'll talk about the function of those structures and then we'll see how we generate an action potential. Here's a hint. You kind of already know how that process takes place. And just remember negative 70 millivolts and plus 30 millivolts, all of that's going to come back. And they're going, you're, you're going to see how the nervous system and the skeletal muscle um, chapter, how they play with one another and how they relate. All right, have a great day.